Okay, so this was one of our other uh, aquaculture projects that we were able to get funding with the license plate money. Um, and I put Helen up here too because she was my technician, but we worked side by side very closely with us for many, many years on this project. Very briefly, the Florida apple snail is the largest freshwater native snail in Florida. And we were tasked back in 2007 with a contract with the South Florida Water Management District to figure out a way to culture the apple snail in captivity at a reasonable dollar amount so that we could potentially look at restocking programs. Um, so the whole grand scheme of this project is not because people really care about the snail. We care about the snail, but the people at the district and uh, Corps of Engineers, Fish and Wildlife are mostly concerned with the fact that the snail is disappearing and impacting the snail kite, which is an endangered bird species of Florida. Um, the Florida apple snail comprises about 90% of this bird's diet. And so when there's um, instances of local extinction of the apple snail, whether it's due to droughts or even flooding in some situations, mostly water management issues, um, this, the snail kites are no longer nesting, they're moving away, their fledglings are dying off. So there's a lot of concern. There's only about 600 birds left in Florida. Um, they are listed uh, as an official endangered species. And more importantly, they're also listed as one of the critical avian species of Everglades restoration. So they're monitoring the recovery of this bird to know how well their restoration effort, efforts in the Everglades is working. And what's been happening for many, many years now is that the bird continues to decline. So that's where we kind of came into play. They contacted Megan um, because of our experience with conch culture, and they thought, well, maybe we could you know, partner up and try to figure out how to take our experience working with a a saltwater snail and change that into working with a freshwater snail, all with the ultimate goal of restoration to preserve this bird. Okay, so since I only have 10 minutes, I'm not going to talk about everything that we did up until our license plate funding. Uh, but from uh, 2007 to 2011, we had a couple, I think three different contracts with the district and a little bit of license plate money um, from the, the very first round where we started from scratch, we had a blank slate building. We were able to design um, our building for a brood stock area. We wanted to see if we could get the animals to breed in captivity, which this is them mating, so we were able to do that. Then we wanted to see if they would actually lay eggs, if the eggs would hatch, how fast the juveniles would grow, you know, everything that goes around with working with a new aquaculture species, like all the questions that we were asking from, from the beginning. So we were able to successfully get them to lay eggs, you can see there's lots of eggs. Um, we had them laying eggs within the first three months of our initial study in 2007, and they've been laying eggs in our hatchery every day since. Um, so what we've been able to do, though, is improve upon the number of eggs that are laid and the number of animals that hatch out so that we're getting higher production and higher quality animals out of our broodstock. And we did a lot of that by working on using different diet studies, kind of fine-tuning the diet, making sure that they're getting the proper nutrition so we're getting the best production out of them, and also looking at density so that we can make sure that we're getting the kind of growth rates that we want to get um, relative to what they normally would be doing in the wild. We also, as part of the overall project with the district, did an economic analysis, so we kept track of our expenses, what it's costing basically to raise every single snail, including as we started fine-tuning our diets and fine-tuning our densities. And ultimately, we were able to get our costs down to about 31 cents per snail for a restocking program, which is pretty much on par with what a lot of the fish restocking programs are, so we felt pretty good. When we first started within the first year, our costs were about $5 a snail. So over the course of uh, several years, we were able to, to like I said, fine-tune and get our costs down pretty good. We have three papers right now that are published with our, the details of like, the how-to culture of these animals that we published in Aquaculture, the Aquaculture Journal. And then there's a fourth one that we're working on right now with the district that kind of um, summarizes the whole program and puts together the economic side of the feasibility of doing restocking and kind of showing that, yes, this is possible. Yes, this can be done for a relative cheap amount of money. So we're working on that one right now. Okay, so the purpose of my presentation today then is just to focus on the one year of funding that I got from when we had our call for proposals for our license plate from 2011 to 2012. 
So this is kind of a continuation of what we had been doing. There are several projects that we wanted to finish up. And there are also some uh, smaller side projects that we were able to work with with one of our interns and a, a colleague at the Division of Aquaculture as well. So we had a couple goals. Uh, you can see here we wanted to complete a field restocking experiment that we had started a few months earlier. So we needed a, a couple more months of, of funding to, to extend and finish that. Uh, we wanted to look at the impacts of the invasive apple snails on native apple snails, mostly in terms of what that might mean for restoration and stock enhancement and where we might be able to put animals. So I'll, I'll explain that in a second. Um, we are working with somebody at Division of Aquaculture to look at um, invasive snail sterilization techniques, a very preliminary experiment, but we had the tanks and the space, and so we partnered up with him on that. And then we also wanted to continue expanding our partnerships, our education, our outreach, and look at other funding opportunities as well. So our field restocking study was done in the um, Lila Empowments, which is in the Loxahatchee National Wildlife Refuge, um, an area of experimental, basically, mini Everglades system that you can do research in. So we were able to get um, the permits to go ahead and do a restocking study there as a large scale. We had. Um, control sites and, and stock sites, and we went back every three weeks to look at egg production. And that was kind of the way that we were monitoring the success of the animals that we put out into the field. So we started this in March of 2011, uh, where we went out and we stocked the snails, not in cages, we let them out in, in the wild, which is more realistic to the scenario that would happen if we were doing a real restocking study. And then we did transects to monitor egg clutch. So this is in March through April. By May, we started getting a really bad drought. By June, July, August, this is what all of the impoundments look like down there. The first time in 10 years they've ever dried up. They were dry for four months. So this obviously is not a snail, but that's what we were seeing when we go out into the field. Now our snails can survive droughts. They're designed to survive dry down periods as part of their ecology for about two months would be the max for them. So we started seeing a lot of empty shells. We had tagged them so we knew which snails were ours. Um, you can see this little trail here, uh, some otter or something going straight to where our snails had been restocked. So that was kind of a bust. Um, the water did come back in September, um, and by that time, even the control sites, like there wasn't really anything going on. So we didn't feel really comfortable about publishing any of that data, but we were able to do a little um, like a gray article for the Friends of Loxahatchee, you know, little newsletter that they do, just kind of explaining our project, explaining the initial preliminary results that we had, um, and going from there. So that was something that, unfortunately, we didn't get to completely finish, but that wasn't our fault. It was nature's fault. <laughs> All right, the next thing that we did, we worked with a, a link intern, and we set up a study looking at different ratios of in native snails and invasive snails. Now these invasive snails, you guys might recognize them, they get the very large, they're about almost three times the size of the natives. They see bright pink egg clutches. They're very invasive, they're all over the place. It's just bad news all around. Um, but since I don't have all day to talk about that, I'm just gonna show you the results of our study. And what we did is, as soon as the animals hatched, we stocked them at different ratios of natives to invasives. And you can see the um, ratio down here, N is native, I means invasive. So, we kind of, um, more natives, and then the reverse, you know, and then equal. And each one had a control. And basically what we found is the more invasives that were in the tank, the slower the native snails grew, which we kind of anticipated based on some other studies with different types of invasive species of snails. But what we saw that we didn't necessarily expect is that the invasive snails actually grew faster when they were exposed to the native snails. So it's like a double whammy of really bad news <laughs> and when for what that means for restocking, you know, that it could have implications. So this is a three month growth study, straightforward experiment. That actually, it's been accepted to the journal Molluscan Studies. I just have to make some edits on it right now. So that paper will be out hopefully within the next few months. Um, and we, would like, we wanted to continue doing this work at some point um, to look at the breeding, the effects of the impacts on the breeding of the animals. Um, invasive snail sterilization, we had a few of a different kind of invasive snail, the spike top apple snail, where the guy division of aquaculture actually irradiated the animals and then sent them to us, put them in our tanks to see if they would spawn. 
um, if they did spawn would any of the eggs hatch. And we actually found that yes, they did spawn a couple times, but none of the eggs hatched. And that was kind of the idea behind it. It was a very, very preliminary study, something that he was doing on the side. He usually works with tilapia. Um, so we, you know, this might be a, a direction to go in the future for work with um, looking at controlling invasive snails. And lastly, we um, continued working with the water management district, both in doing publications and exchanging snails when any of us had extra snails or eggs, even though we're not technically funded, funding each other right now. Um, we've set, submitted a several grants with the Miccosukee tribe, which has control over some of the area in uh, Water Conservation Area 3A, which is where we could do some of our stock enhancement studies that we wanted to do. And we've also worked with uh, several, with an um, environmental consulting firm to do some toxicity studies. So we have small contracts as well. And lastly, that's all the education um, throughout the year. This is just the number of students and schools that came, either came to aquaculture that I did in a little apple snail, you know, um, hands-on activity with, or I went and I did talks for some of the teachers and educators about the, the whole program that we've been doing. And that's it. <laughs> so, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.